These are tumultuous times in the U.S. The country has been shaken by protests sparked by the death of George Floyd, a black man who died while being arrested by a white police officer. The demonstrations are the largest seen in decades. Protesters are demanding an end to police brutality and racism. It's almost like police officers have been able to just do whatever they've been wanting to do. On the streets, this frustration turns to violence. Buildings are torched and businesses plundered. Right-wing militias like American Wolf take it upon themselves to preserve law and order. These people that are down there, they're not protesters, they're criminals, and they're actively working to help destabilize our government. And President Trump keeps fueling the tensions with his rhetoric. Proud Proud boys, stand back and stand by. October in Louisville, Kentucky, a city scarred by the pandemic and protests. Windows are boarded up. The clashes that occurred here in recent months have left their mark. The city is still reeling from the death of black medical worker Brianna Taylor, who died while police were searching her home in March. Black Lives Matter activist Katura Harron wants justice for Brianna. She accuses the police of getting away with murder thanks to the structural racism in the U.S. Brianna Taylor is her hero and the symbol of a movement that will no longer be silenced. Personally and emotionally, Brianna Taylor's name, uh, for me, it, it gives me strength. She gives me hope. Um, and she gives me a reason to wake up every day um, and, and fight for justice. I mean, um, I'm, I'm, I'm 40 years old and um, we have I've seen uh, the injustices of, of, of black people um, in this nation. And, um, you know, the black woman is the most disrespected woman um, in America. And so um, for me, um, you know, she, she just gives me that strength to keep fighting. Brianna Taylor lived here on the outskirts of Louisville. In March, police entered her apartment using a no-knock warrant. This type of search warrant authorizes officers to enter private premises without announcing their presence and forcibly open doors. The police were searching for drugs but found none. An exchange of gunfire ensued and Brianna Taylor died in a hail of bullets. You can see from out here that when police officers started um, shooting that they shot from outside the home. And so here's one still bullet hole in uh, police evidence tape um, that was still there. So it shows evidence that they were shooting from outside. And so, you know, it's just very um, unfortunate. And um, just the amount of bullets that um, was reported, um, over 20 bullets shot um, that night um, inside the home. Police strategist Katura Harron drafted Brianna's law, which bans the use of no-knock warrants in Louisville. It's now been passed, and she hopes it will soon be adopted throughout Kentucky. She says the roots of police brutality lie in the judicial system and with the police themselves. There's different policies that are passed at the legislative level, and then you see different police policies or police practices that are done on, on the ground level. and so. I think that it's a combination of, of all the things and then um, also just a combination of um, no police accountability, like no one is really holding um, the police accountable and it's almost like police officers have been able to just do whatever they've been wanting to do. 3,000 kilometers to the west, they aim to provide backup to the police. At a secret location in the U.S. state of Washington, members of the American Wolf Militia meet for shooting practice. Their leader, entrepreneur Peter Diaz. Their weapon of choice, the infamous AK-47, also known as the Kalashnikov. Originally developed for the Soviet Army, Diaz now plans to use the assault rifle to defend America's freedom.
Ah. Uh, it's pretty good. Uh, classic. <laughs> so they don't make them like that anymore, right? You could drop it in the mud. <laughs> Peter Diaz founded American Wolf not long ago. He's financed the militia using more than $100,000 of his own money earned by renting out office furniture. He feels it's his mission to protect America with arms if necessary. <laughs> I think it should be important for everybody to be familiar with it because especially right now, uh, you just don't really know what's gonna happen next. Um, the place that we're in, that this country and the world really is in right now, if I would have told you six months or a year ago that we were gonna be locked down, told where you could travel, um, told what you can and can't do, who you can and can't hang out with, where you can eat, where you can't eat, the amount of control that's being um, pushed on us right now, nobody would have ever believed me. Um, so, saying something that this may be important in the future um, isn't as outlandish as one would think. It's estimated the USA is home to some 180 militias. American Wolf has around 10 active members. Many are former soldiers and, like Peter Diaz, subscribe to conspiracy theories. What is happening right now is our government is in the midst of a coup. Uh, there's certain members of our government who are actively working to change this government from what it's designed to be, uh, the land of opportunity. They're trying to turn us into some sort of socialist government, a new form of government, humanitarianism. Um, I don't know who or why exactly, but it really doesn't matter who or why. It, all that matters is it doesn't happen. Testers, for example. Cynthia Miller Idris is all too familiar with these kinds of theories. She heads the Polarization and Extremism Research and Innovation Lab at the American University in Washington, D.C. And she warns that militias are among those profiting most from the current political climate. All the militia groups, and in fact, I would say all extremist groups essentially are defined by most centrally by a sense of threat, a sense of existential threat, a dire threat, a feeling that my people, whether that's a race or a gender or, or a nation, are at threat because of this other group and that I'm morally compelled to act against them. And so that takes heroic, warrior-like action. Katura Heron's whole life has been shaped by structural racism. She says she's never broken the law, yet she's been arrested several times. From an early age, her parents made her aware that the police could pose a very real threat. The fear of being stopped by the cops follows her wherever she goes. It's always been a situation where um, you're told whenever you um, interact with the police, you know, you... Um, back then, you know, when I, I grew up, it was um, say yes ma'am, no ma'am, uh, yes sir, no sir. Uh, do everything that they ask you to do. And now that that is kind of shifted to where it's make sure that your um, hands are being seen, keep your hands on the steering wheel. If you're gonna pull something out of your glove box, like your insurance or registration, um, make sure you're telling them exactly what you're doing at every single moment. For years, Katura Heron had been thinking of buying a handgun. The protests in recent months have finally made up her mind. So if you take the mag out, just hit that button right there. There you go. And then slide this one in there. You'll be able to feel the difference. Just slide it, turn it this way. Oh, this one. There you go. And just punch it in there. Now put it in your hand. Mm. Does it feel better? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because of this. Exactly. This, uh, yeah. A lot of folks, when they get smaller guns and they grip it, they don't like for their pinky to float. So what I was able to get was a 9 millimeter, Very small. I really liked it because it fits in my hand. Um, I really liked the grip on it. And so for me, it was, it, 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 I was looking for something that is lightweight and um, something that I could fit that could, you know, I could have on me and conceal, um, and it wasn't very heavy. And so uh, it's perfect. 
and so now I just need to get to a gun range. Yet it's not fear of the police that's convinced her to get a gun. She says it's the armed militias who are turning up at protests more and more often. I mean, it's scary, obviously, and you never know what's going to happen when you're out. And um, I think that it's important um, if, if, if folks can um, arm themselves for that extra protection, that they do so. Um, I, I don't go out by myself now, and so um, I'm usually with um, at least one or two other people. And so um, if there's a case where I need to be out alone, then this is, this is something that I can take with me to, to feel secure. 15 minutes, that's all the time it takes to buy a gun in Kentucky. And saleswoman Tanae Deaton says she's never sold as many firearms as she has in recent months. She thinks it's right that more and more civilians are taking matters into their own hands, especially in times like these. I think it's nice that people are willing to do something like that, but I fear for them, you know, because they don't have the training that some of the police officers may have, or it scares me. So it's nice to know that there's people out there that are willing to risk their lives for something like that that doesn't necessarily belong to them. The militia American Wolf en route to what they call their next mission. Their destination, Portland, Oregon. Peter Diaz wants to see the Black Lives Matter protests there for himself. Still, he's already convinced they're violent, though he's never actually been there. His pistol is always within reach to use in self-defense, he says. These people that are down there, they're not protesters, they're criminals, and they're actively working to help destabilize our government to destroy our way of life. That's what we're up against right now. Going down in full riot gear and throwing rocks or breaking windows and looting shops, how does that have anything to do whatsoever with racial equality? They use the BLM movement simply to keep public support. For months, activists have been taking to the streets of Portland. Deaths have resulted from the clashes between left and right-wing demonstrators. At the height of the conflict, Donald Trump sent anonymous federal agents into the city in a bid to present himself as the law and order president. The demonstrators view the presence of the right-wing militia as a provocation and start chanting their discontent. Peter Diaz and his men soon find themselves surrounded by Black Lives Matter activists. This man even threatens the militiamen with physical violence. Despite the crush of people, none of Diaz's men are wearing masks. The mood grows increasingly tense. They were walking around as a group of people, into a group of people, surrounded by a group of people while not wearing face coverings, despite that being the law, understandably so, because we're in the middle of a pandemic, like we're all wearing masks. Right? I believe like some of it has to do with uh, our president. Uh, he has let that kind of behavior and that ideology just flourish. And I think that now they think that they have power um, when they don't. We're out here for Black Lives Matter and they're out here for white supremacy. So there's a clear, you know, there's a clear difference of opinion and their opinion is not welcome here. It's actually not welcome anywhere. Diaz insists his group doesn't stand for white supremacy, yet it doesn't take long for a fight to break out. He accuses a protester of taking drugs. She's not on drugs, that's my friend, don't start that. She's far from drugs, so don't come out here with that. That's that typical white that y'all say about black people. Own drugs. So don't start that. Don't start that. Don't start that. Don't start that. I heard everything you said because I've been standing. In my opinion, when it gets to this type of um, of mob mentality, it should be dispersed. That's where I stand with it. Um, the police hanging back. I understand that they're worried about. Uh, the number's growing, but I would handle the situation differently if, if I had the manpower and equipment. On this night, the police keep hanging back. Eventually, Peter Diaz and his men are forced to retreat by Black Lives Matter demonstrators.
I think we have been witnessing a polarization of society and now much more a radicalization of society, particularly among young people. And now we're also seeing that, I think, people taking to the streets, which in peaceful protest makes perfect sense. But when you combine that with gun sales and with people feeling extraordinarily anxious, both about the rise of these militias and the violence that they're seeing and accelerating plots and violence, uh, and we're seeing um, you know, just increasing media coverage of them in the streets and uncertainty about what's happening next, an unknown danger with the virus or how things are gonna play out. Uh, I think we're in a really, it's sort of a tinderbox situation. <laughs> Kenosha, Wisconsin in late August. After African-American Jacob Blake was shot by police, protesters set buildings on fire. Once again, people's anger spilled out onto the streets. Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! They're saying enough is enough and demanding an end to police brutality. Scenes like these ones in Kenosha this past summer have become a common sight in cities across the U.S. The police respond with tear gas and the demonstrators by burning barricades. The police weren't always able to prevent incidents of looting and plundering, so right-wing militias like the Kenosha Guard took it up on themselves to patrol the streets. Among them was a 17-year-old Trump supporter, seen here in cell phone footage. After being chased, he allegedly shot dead two Black Lives Matter demonstrators. Exclusive images taken by our camera team show the rifleman just after the shootings. He tries to turn himself over to the police to no avail. He was not arrested and charged with murder until the following day. The American Wolf militia later called him a hero and collected tens of thousands of dollars in donations towards his defense. The double murder suspect even received backing from the White House. He was trying to get away from them, I guess, it looks like, and he fell, and then they very violently attacked him, and it was something that we're looking at right now, and it's under investigation, but uh, I guess he was in very big trouble. He would have been, I, he probably would have been killed. I mean, the most important thing, I think, is that he never should have been there in the first place, right? And to react after that, from any elected official or authority to have a reaction that legitimizes violence or valorizes it by calling him an American hero or saying that he was justified in his violence, even if it turns out to be self-defense, even if, you know, it is, really what we need is de-escalation and a walking back of that kind of um, rhetoric and not something that further legitimizes the next person to feel like they should go out and take matters into their own hands. Katura Haran doesn't buy Donald Trump's rhetoric. She holds the president responsible for the fact that the two sides' differences are growing more irreconcilable by the day. And that civilians now feel the need to patrol the streets armed with weapons. He was in very big trouble. He would have been, I, he probably would have been killed. But... They're coming out because, um, you know, the leader of this nation is calling for them to be out. And so they're doing exactly what he's asked them to do. Um, I mean, you see in, in the situation in Kenosha, the young man who went there, he didn't even live in Kenosha, um, you know, but he felt like that um, he needed to come there and, and do what um, the leader of this nation has said. And, and, and he actually um, caused and brutalized and caused more harm to that community. And as we've seen important Cynthia Miller Idris has another worry. The more often President Trump backs the right-wing militias, the more it emboldens them. Donald Trump clearly stated his support for such groups during his first TV debate with Joe Biden. Are you willing tonight to condemn white supremacists and militia groups and to say that they need to stand down. Proud well, boys, stand back and stand by, but I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, somebody's got to do something about Antifa and the left, because this is not a right-wing problem. Immediately, my research team was seeing online, 
you know, chatter in far right channels that were saying, you know, thumbs up and they, they created a new logo, um, you know, right away for the Proud Boys. There was a t-shirt on for sale within 12 hours with it on it. Um, so they immediately saw it as a, we're, we're being called to action and being called to support the president and being called to support the administration. In late August, thousands took to the streets of Washington to protest against the president. In front of the White House, they demanded an end to racism and made clear who they held politically responsible. On August 28th, its 57th anniversary, Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech was played over loudspeakers. Live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these Jews to be self-evident. I think it's a shame to see where we were 57 years ago and where we are now, that he was making that speech that still applies to today. Not, barely anything has changed. And yet they're doing all these performative acts, naming streets. Even this right here, even though it's nice, it's pretty to look at, real change is not being committed. I personally think that we have a president that is evoking the white racist and the racial tension and the racial tension to come out it's, it's something that i never thought would happen um, just growing up you think that there's progress and then now you see that there hasn't been much progress mingling among the demonstrators are members of radical black nationalist organizations like the new black panthers and the nfac a fringe group that's grown substantially of late NFAC leader Grandmaster Jay accuses white sympathizers of the Black Lives Matter movement of hypocrisy. Even though you say Black Lives Matter, even though you out here with your fists in the air, even though you acting like you down for the cause, you ain't redistributed the wealth, you ain't redistributed the land, you ain't came back and redistributed the political power. In other words, you just giving us lip service and we don't need no more of that. The ultimate goal is to be treated as an equal human being in every aspect that there is. But the way that we get there is we need some space to heal. We need some space to recover from 400 years of enslavement. We need some place to go back and remember 25 dynasties of our culture that's been taken away from us. We need some place to go and get over post-traumatic slave disorder. We need somewhere to go and learn and feel proud about ourselves and to love ourselves. We need that. So we need some space to do that. And since the United States of America is unwilling or hasn't been given the opportunity, which they have, to give us that space, we've got to create it on our own. If inside of the confines of the law, if that works, but if not, then I guess we just have to do it at the barrel of a gun. The NFAC trains its members how to use weapons to pursue the malicious dream of creating its own all-black state and it says to defend itself against the attacks by white police officers. Its leader rejects criticism of the organization's paramilitary dress. Why is it that when we decide to dress like this, it's a problem, but when, you, when people who look like you decide to not only dress up like us, but get weapons, threaten the police, threaten politicians, it's not called the militia, it's not called the white militia, it's called citizens that are protesting. But the moment we do it, why are you doing it? Are the guns necessary? Why are y'all dressed like that? Who are you going to attack? When the truth of the matter is, we are the response. We're not the offense, we're the defense. There have long been black separatist movements as well, but the white supremacist separatist movements are calling for a white ethno state. In many ways now we're seeing that echoed in that same kind of a call. And I think that's a reflection of the of this growing sense of polarization, a, a kind of radicalization to, and a, and a giving up on the idea of coexistence um, for larger numbers of people, of coexistence and, and, and really sort of peaceful democracy in the way that our democracy is. So I think those are real challenges. Peter Diaz is paying a visit to his parents who live in Washington state. Hello? Hey, son. Hey, mom. Hello, doing really well. Peter's mother, Ann Diaz, hasn't seen much of her son since he began touring through the United States with his militia. While he's concerned about his country's future, she's more worried about his safety. Peter, do you want the cilantro? Uh, it was for the, uh, was for the clams. For the clams. Uh, thank you. Oh, I want to take this into uh, Aaron. You, this yeah. is too hot out here. I don't think there's any reason for violence, and that is the piece that, that really frightens me. Um, Peter has had several death threats, 
and I'm terrified for that, honestly, as, as his mother. I would like for the police to do their jobs and for people like my son and others to be able to stand down and not take up arms and not have to feel that they need to protect themselves or their families or their way of life, because I think in some ways that's where we're going to. This culture war keeps creating ever greater divisions in American society. Yet it is in itself full of contradictions, as can be seen in Peter Diaz's own family. His father was an illegal immigrant who came to the U.S. from Mexico. His mother is a white American. Yet the family views immigration as a threat and seeks to defend what's theirs. It's in the um, refrigerator. In the bottom drawer. We're not in a position right now to be able to help people coming here. We need to take care of the issues we have here already and the people who are starving to death in the country who are already citizens before we're really in a position to welcome more people in and help them. Ah! Louisville, Kentucky in October. Four weeks ahead of the presidential elections, protesters take to the streets once again. In late September, Kentucky's Attorney General revealed that the police officers who shot Breonna Taylor would not face murder charges. The decision came as a shock for Keturah Heron and many others. She fears the months of protests were all in vain. Now she's pinning all her hopes on a new president will tackle the systemic racism in her country. I think that this was probably the biggest election um, in our lifetime. I think that, you know, when we were voting in um, uh, past President Obama, we felt like that that was a big election. And I think that this election is bigger than that. I think that um, we have to um, end this rhetoric. We have to um, protect all uh, folks in the United States. and. I don't think that the current um, administration has done that. Um, I think that they um, have, have not, I feel like that they've been misusing and abusing their power. And so um, th this, this, this election is, is the most important that I've ever seen. Oh, freedom over me. Come on, stand up. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my Keturah Harran is especially concerned that Donald Trump has refused to commit to a peaceful transfer of power should he lose the election. In Louisville, they're singing for peace and for an end of the escalation of violence.